right, welcome everyone. In the next two videos, I'm going to be going over two different 16-7 uh, example problems. This is kind of a continuation of my one uh, exam questions from old exams. However, uh, for 16-7, 16-8, 16 right, there's not enough published exams. So I went and I kind of modified some book examples to make them into some questions that I think would be reasonable ones to show up on quizzes, exams, things like that. So, in this video, I'd like to focus on example number one here, but I would like you to recognize here in this first video how similar these two examples look, right? The claim is that they are subtly different and they're giving you different, right? Their, their interpretation of what you're calculating is certainly different in each one of these cases. Uh, and so for this video, I'm gonna go ahead and calculate out the result for example number one, talk about how do we actually find this calculation uh, and an interpretation of that. And then in the next video, right, uh, we're going to do example number two, and then we'll do a little bit of a comparison, and we'll talk a little bit about what is the interpretation of what we've calculated for the second example. All right, so the first example, I have a uh, page for it all by itself here. We would like to calculate out some surface integral. Remember, 16.7 is all about surface integrals. S, our surface here, is a part of the paraboloid. It's not the entire paraboloid, right? The paraboloid would go on forever, but it's only the piece that's inside of this cylinder, x squared plus y squared equals four. So again, maybe if I was to draw the situation here, we have the paraboloid, and if you'd like to, you can even put this into the rz half plane, right? This could be maybe z equals r squared, and then you could spin it around and whatnot. So the paraboloid is gonna look something like this. It's kind of the classic paraboloid that we know and hopefully love from 12.6, uh, you know, back when we brought up quadric surfaces. So something like this. Again, this paraboloid would continue on forever, but we only want the piece that's stuck inside of the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals four. So x squared plus y squared equals four, that's a circle of radius two in the xy plane. So z equals zero. But again, remember, kind of, it doesn't, there's no z coordinate here. There's no z's in the equation. So we can free to roam in the z direction. It can move up, it can move down, anything like this. So this right here would be the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals four. And so you can see that the cylinder, sorry, the paraboloid here, there's a piece that's inside of this and then it would continue and it would get a bigger and bigger radius, kind of as if you have bigger and bigger z values. And so this is the piece of the paraboloid that we're talking about. This is our s. So this is the thing that we're trying to calculate out some integral over. All right, so in example number one, we are adding up, right? All integrals are summing up something. And we're adding up z coordinates, right? So this is really the height of this paraboloid over the surface here. So the height of this paraboloid over this, over just this piece. So looking at it, like if you were to just take some sampling points, you know, it seems like all of my z coordinates for all of these points, they're positive, right? Because they live above this xy plane, this z equals zero. So here's all the places where the z coordinate would be zero. And then these all live, well, there's one I suppose that actually is at zero down here. So I'm adding up a bunch of z coordinates, one of which is zero, and the rest are positive. So I'm hoping at the end of the day, I should get out a positive number. I'm thinking that this should be greater than zero after I add up a bunch of positive numbers. So this is kind of an interpretation of what we're doing here. We could also think if maybe the mass uh, of this you know, surface right here, maybe it's some lamina, some sheet, uh, if this was proportional maybe at each point to the height of the point, right? So in this case, proportional to the height would be this z right here. And I'm trying to describe some density function. Then adding up the density across the surface would give you the mass of the overall sheet, right? The mass of this surface here. So this would be another kind of way to interpret what are we calculating here? We could think of it as a mass if this was some density. All right, so let's go ahead and start with the evaluation. We know that any time that you evaluate out a surface integral like this over some scalar function, there's always two ways to go about this, right? One is if your surface is given to you parametrically, or if you parameterize your surface and go about it that way. And another way is if your surface is given to us explicitly. That is if we have our surface given by z equals, right? So in this case, well, our surface is the paraboloid, right? There's always kind of, 
uh, maybe, I would say usually there's two things given to us, right? One is the actual surface. So our surface here is the paraboloid. And the other one is bounds, right? So how is this surface bounded? In this case, this surface does not go on forever. And normally the paraboloid would, but we only care about the piece, right? Bounded by the cylinder. So, okay, we have bounds and then we have the actual surface. So our surface here is z equals x squared plus y squared. And the big thing here is that we have z equals. So therefore our surface is given to us explicitly. And so since our surface is given to us explicitly, remember we can go ahead and transform this ds right here. There's always these two options versus, you know, if you're given parametrically, if you're given explicitly. Now we have explicitly, so I'm gonna go ahead and use the formula. This is the square root of g sub x squared plus g sub y squared plus one, all under that square root, and then dA. And so this right here is really the magnitude of a normal vector. Right, so this is going to be a normal vector to the surface, and we'll take the magnitude of it. So let's go ahead and maybe start calculating this out a little bit. So first of all, let's do g, g sub x squared. So our g function, again, this comes from the surface over here. So our g function is x squared plus y squared. We need to take the partial derivative of it with respect to x, and then we need to square that. So the partial derivative with respect to x would be 2x. When I square that, that's going to be 4x squared. Partial derivative with respect to y squared. Well, that's going to be 2y. Square that. I'm going to get 4y squared plus 1, all under my square root. Remember, whenever we do out a double integral like this with these da's, really we have to take this and we have to smash it down into the xy plane. So this is where the residue would live, right? So this is kind of the region that we're integrating over. So we can integrate. Anytime you have like a double integral like this, we can do dy dx, we can do dx dy, or we can do r dr d theta, right? We can switch it into polar. And the fact that we have kind of over in a nice circle here, we're probably leaning pretty hard towards polar. For now though, let me continue and I'm just gonna write dA one last time. I wanna say though, right, no matter what, we don't have z's. Whether you do y first, then x, or x first, then y, or if you switch into polar, right, there are no z's. So we have to switch out z for something with x's and y's that is somehow, right, reasonable for when we're on the surface. So when we're on the surface, this paraboloid, we know that z is equivalent, is equal to x squared plus y squared. So we can go ahead and trade in, instead of z, we can write x squared plus y squared. And now we've switched it all into x's and y's. And like we just talked about though, probably we wanna switch this into polar. So let's go ahead and make this polar. Instead of x squared plus y squared, I'm gonna write r squared. We have four x squared plus four y squared. That's gonna be four r squared. Oops, well, just kinda of went crazy on me there for a second. So four r squared, don't forget our plus one. And then whenever we switch our dA, right, this is gonna be r dr d theta. Let's go ahead and set up our bounds and then we can go ahead and work on evaluating. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up our bounds by drawing this little picture here in the xy plane. So this is the same kind of residue that I have up here from smashing down this paraboloid, right? Where would the residue live? I'm just taking this and drawing it in the xy plane, how we normally like to look at these sorts of things. So we can see that it's a circle centered at the origin and we need to know what is the radius of this circle. Well, it seems to live all inside of this cylinder, right? And that kind of makes sense. It's bounded, it's inside the cylinder. So the cylinder has the equation x squared plus y squared equals four. So that would be the same thing as r squared equals four, or that's gonna be r is equal to plus or minus two. But remember, we only like positive radiuses. So this is gonna have a radius of two. So that being said, now we can set up our bounds. The radius is gonna go from zero to two, right? All of the inside stuff all the way out to two. And then we're gonna go all the way around the circle. So that's gonna be from zero to two pi. So here's the full setup. Now we can go ahead and work on the evaluation. Well, one thing I noticed that all of my bounds are constant and I only have a function of r's in here. This makes it very easy to rip apart this integral and evaluate with respect to theta. This is gonna be essentially integrating one d theta. So when I evaluate one d theta, right, and I plug in zero to two pi, I'm just gonna get out two pi. All right, now I have the more complicated integral here, integrating from zero to two, and I'm gonna have, let's see, r squared root four r squared plus one times r dr. Well, my best hope is probably a u substitution, 
All right, so let's go ahead and try u substitution. I'm going to let u be the inside thing. That's going to be 4r squared plus 1. And so du is going to be equal to 8r dr. And I notice that I have an r dr here, right? So, okay, maybe I'm going to go ahead and solve for that. I'm going to have r dr is equal to du divided by 8. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and be able to trade this in for du over 8. Likewise, here I'm going to be able to trade this piece in for root u. The only thing that I have a little bit of trouble with is how do I trade in r squared for things with u's? Well, for this, I need to go back to my equation here, and I can go ahead and see, well, u minus 1 would be equal to 4r squared. So therefore, r squared would be equal to, let's see, this would be u minus 1 all over 4. So therefore, if I want to trade in r squared for things with u's in it, it would be u minus 1 all over 4. And now I have to be a little bit careful here, right, because this 0 to 2, these were u values. So technically, it's incorrect for me, sorry, the 0 to 2, these were r values. So technically, it's incorrect to say that they stay the same for u, right? Now I'm set up a u integral. So it's probably not from u equals 0 to u equals 2, right? So I'm going to go ahead and erase these for the time being, and let me go ahead and swap them out. So again, I had r equals 0, and I'd like to trade that in for some u value. Well, again, here's a way that we can trade in for some u value, right? If I had r equals 0, and so I plug in 0 everywhere I see an r, I would get out u equals 1. So r equals 0 somehow corresponds to u equals 1. Likewise, if I was to plug in r equals 2, into this formula. So I did want to integrate to 2, r equals 2. So let's see, that would be 2 squared, that's 4 times 4 would be 16, plus 1, that's u equals 17. So now these are u values, and I've set up a u integral here. All right, now we can go ahead and evaluate this. Notice that I have some constants here, 4 and 8. I'm going to go ahead and factor those out from my integral. So if I factor out the 4 and the 8, right, that would make 32 altogether. It uh, looks like I have a 2 in the numerator, so I think I'm going to get pi divided by 16 after I factor out all of my constants. And I'm left with u minus 1 times root u. All right, so in order to evaluate this, I need to probably distribute, right? Because we don't have a product rule for antiderivatives. So let me go ahead and distribute that. The way, of course, that we're going to combine these and simplify is remembering that the square root of u is the same thing as u to the 1 half power. So when I go ahead and I distribute this, I'm going to have u to the 3 halves power, right? So this is u to the first times u to the 1 half power. So we add our exponents together. So 1 plus 1 half is going to be 1 and a half, aka 3 halves. And then we're going to subtract away u to the 1 half power du. So OK, I distributed that. Now let's go ahead and integrate. So pi over 16, when I integrate, again, I'm going to raise my exponent by 1, so I'm going to go to 5 halves, and then I multiply by the reciprocal here, 2 fifths. And double check, if you take the derivative of this, you should get back to where you started. And then I'm going to go ahead and subtract, and again, we raise our power by 1, so it goes from 3 half, sorry, from 1 half to 3 halves, then I go ahead and I multiply by the reciprocal. And again, we're going from 1 to 17. All right, so now let's go ahead and plug these things in. Again, I have pi over 16 here. And when I plug in 17, let's see, I'm going to have 2 fifths, 17 raised to the 5 halves. Subtract away 2 thirds, 17 raised to the 3 halves. So that's going to be in the first bit. And then I'm going to subtract away when I plug in 1. So 1 raised to the 5 halves is just going to be 1. So I'm subtracting away 2 fifths times 1. And then I'm going to subtract away 2 thirds times 1. And just as an FYI, if you were to go ahead and plug this into a calculator, so this would be approximately equal to 84.46. And so again, we were expecting this to be a positive number because the interpretation was we were adding up the z coordinates for every point on the surface, right? We were adding up over a surface, and the thing that we were adding up was the z values. 
So right, that's going to be the height of these things. We thought that this should be a positive number. And another interpretation would be if maybe the density of the surface was based on its height, right? It was more dense the higher that it was. What is the overall mass? So right, in this case, we would say maybe 84.46 grams or pounds or something like this. So this is the interpretation of what we are calculating out here with the surface integral. So again, you can see that these things take some time. But I think that this is still reasonable enough to maybe put, I mean, it would be a long uh, quiz or exam question. Maybe they would do a setup but do not evaluate sort of deal. Um, but yeah, we could actually even evaluate this all the way out with, uh, you know, without a calculator or anything. So, all right, that's our first problem here. Again, in our next video, I'm going to be kind of relating this problem to a very similar looking problem, right? It's the surface integral, but the claim is this one is over a vector field. So instead of over a scalar function, we have over a vector field. And so what are we calculating out with this? What kind of technique are we going to use? It is different, right, when integrating over a vector field. Uh, so please watch the next video, and we will go over example number two. I hope to see you then.